everybody. Welcome to the most depressing talk of this conference, why you can't buy cloud native. So why, why is this sad? Well, let's, let's start with the opposite. Let's start with a happy subject, shopping. Hands up, who likes shopping? Half the hands. Okay, what if I, I've got, I've, I think I've got sort of set myself up here because I've got a picture of a grocery basket. Hands up, who likes grocery shopping? Yeah, okay. Hands up, who likes shopping for tech gadgets? All of us, right? Like, is there anything better than the day the new MacBook arrives? And it's just like, oh. The only thing better is the day before when you're sort of on the internet going, oh, should I have a 14 inch or a 16 inch? And oh, how much memory? It's just, we like shopping. That, that's what we do. And I think we're, we're lucky. We're, we're in an industry where we get to do a lot of shopping for tech gadgets. And the best thing is most of it is open source and we don't even have to pay for it. And when we think about our industry and we think about you know, the sort of the, the new things in the pipeline that are shiny and exciting that we want, cloud native, I think, is, is definitely up there. Maybe you know, but not quite so much in 2022 as it was when I first wrote this talk <laughs> way before the pandemic. But you know, for, the, for a while, when you would go around a conference, every single booth would be like, we're cloud native, we're cloud native. Um, and I think in, um, in the US, someone told me that um, Capital One, which is a bank, they even have adverts you know, on the telly to sort of their consumers saying, look, we're cloud native, because everybody wants to be cloud native. And as techies, when we see something like cloud native that everybody wants and we want it to, our first thought is awesome. Where's the source code? How do I install it? Where do I buy it? But the depressing part is I don't think it quite works this way for cloud native. But I'm not sure. You know, that, that's sort of my opinion. And certainly cloud native has become really strongly associated with particular technologies. So I think Sam Newman got frustrated at, for a while because every time he would talk to someone, they'd say, I want to be cloud native, so I'm going to install Kubernetes. And it's like, well, no, those, those two aren't necessary and sufficient. You, you can be cloud native without Kubernetes, and you can use Kubernetes and really not be cloud native. And I'm aware that there is a little bit of an irony here um, because I work for a vendor. I work for Red Hat. My employer would really, really like it if you all left <laughs> this talk and went away and you know, bought, well, they'd like it if you went away and downloaded everything that we did and they'd really like it if you went away and bought everything that we did. Um, so OpenShift <laughs> makes you cloud native. Um, I work on Quarkus. And one of the things that we talk about when we explain the benefits of Quarkus is that Quarkus is a cloud-native technology. Quarkus can help you become cloud-native. So, slightly ironic. But it's, I mean, <laughs> I was about to say it's ironic, but it is, you know, it is kind of true. Quarkus is really cool. Quarkus can make your cloud cloudier. It can help you get more benefits from your cloud. So one of the things that Quarkus does is it starts up ridiculously, ridiculously fast. And so I did some benchmarks um, of Quarkus startup times against light switches and light bulbs, because we, you know, we sort of want to get to that mode where it's as easy to bring your cloud instances up and down as it is to turn on a light switch. And compared to a fluorescent bulb, which starts in about 30 seconds, anything you can do in Java is going to be pretty fast. Um, but if you zoom in on that chart, just to an LED bulb, which appears to be instantaneous and actually isn't, Quarkus native starts in about a third of the time that it takes to switch on a good LED bulb, which is kind of amazing. And of course, that, that startup time for Quarkus Really, really useful in some circumstances if you're doing serverless, if you're doing a lot of continuous deployment. In other circumstances, actually, it's kind of a cool toy and you go, ooh, this is so exciting. Sometimes I just sit and I just like start up Quarkus and then I stop it and then I start up Quarkus and then I stop it and it's, it's kind of, 
enjoyable, but it's not actually useful. But of course, the other thing about Quarkus is it has a really small um, footprint. So you can, it takes less memory. You can run more Quarkus instances on a virtual machine, which saves money. And the other thing about Quarkus is it's got this really great developer experience. That's something that the team have worked on really hard. So all of that, why you should buy Quarkus, except you can't buy Quarkus because it's free, is kind of, I think, neither here nor there, because even though Quarkus is so cool, is it, is it going to make you cloud native? I don't know. Is it, is it even going to solve your problems? I don't know. It, it depends what your problems are. And, and when we say we should be more cloud native, I'm going to make us more cloud native. And so you've got your CTO with your little CTO shopping list, and you sort of go to try and figure out what, what does this mean? What do I have to download to become cloud native? The first question is, well, wait a minute. What, <laughs> what is it I should be looking to download? And that comes down to sort of some questions, I think, about when we say cloud native, what do we mean? Now, often, I think we do have cloud native and Kubernetes as synonyms in our head. Um, often, we think of cloud native and microservices as synonyms. And even the CNCF, actually, for the longest time, their website just said cloud native means microservices. When you look a bit deeper into how cloud native applications are developed, a lot of it, um, it's, it's, it comes from being born on the cloud, really. Some of these things, you just if you start on the cloud, it's going to be cloud native. If you don't start on the cloud, it's going to be harder. But a, a lot of the ideas are really similar to the ideas of DevOps. So things like, you know, you own it, you ship it, you manage it, let's ship it often. If you sort of took off the cloud native word, it sounds like DevOps. If you if you look back to the sort of the, <laughs> before we were really talking about cloud native, again, a lot of the ideas of cloud native are similar to the 12 factor application. We've stopped talking about 12 factors, I think because 12 is sort of a lot to remember. So now we just sort of say cloud native instead. But another thing I've noticed is that we talk so much about cloud native, I think we've forgotten that you are actually allowed to say cloud. You don't have to say cloud native. And so sometimes we, we're just talking about something mean on the cloud, but we, we say it's cloud native. And sometimes, again, because cloud native is so, so dominant now, when we say cloud native, what we really just mean is, I wrote this application in 2022. It, it's a modern application written the way it should be. Finally, sometimes when we talk about cloud native, we mean an application is item potent. But no one's going to buy item potent because no one's actually going to know what it is. I always have to look it up every time I talk about it. Item potency basically means that when you visit your application, it behaves the same way each time. So it's, it's that characteristic that you really need in the cloud of not being super coupled to its environment and not being super coupled to its state so that when Kubernetes takes your pod down, when you bring your pod back up, everything still works. And finally, <laughs> I think I said finally last time, but I think, again, because cloud native has become so popular, even though to me cloud native means born on the cloud, we have this idea that we're going to migrate something to be cloud native, which makes my head hurt a little bit, but it's, it's something that we do see. So when you are deciding your application architecture, how do you, how do you choose? How do you sort of narrow down the field of zillions of possible architectures? Often, it, the decision kind of ends up being made for you because you, you go to tech conferences, you see what everyone else is doing, you see the best practices, and then that's sort of the, the way you go. And I think, you know, so it means that when you go to the architecture shop, even though in theory there's lots of architectures, 
you know, the sort of the monolith is this kind of dusty thing that's way at the back of the shop or maybe even in the basement and you have to ask them to go like dig it out and then you have to sort of dust it off and there's loads of microservices in the front of the window. That's what you get steered to because you're writing an application in 2022 and you want to be modern and nice. And no one wants to be the person who goes and says, I know everybody else is doing cloud native, but I'm going to do a monolith because that raises awkward questions about, do you know what year it is? And there is a really strong element of fashion in, in how we make these architectural choices. And you may think I'm being too cynical. Surely no one would actually choose an architecture just because they want to look good in front of their peers. But actually, Red Hat did a survey a while ago. And the sort of the headline was the main drivers for container-based development, so cloud native really. Most people said it was career progression in-house or externally. And so career progression is a nice way of saying CV-driven development, right? <laughs> it is completely, <laughs> I want to do cloud native because it will make me look good. But I, don't, I said I didn't want to be cynical. And I think we are legitimately excited by technology. I think we are adventurers. And when we see something like the CNCF landscape, the reason that we want to download every single thing on the CNCF landscape is because we want to try it. We want to, we want to explore it. Is, exciting. But there is a little bit of an element of consumption as well, right? That, you know, when we look at the landscape, we see, ooh, these are all things I could try. And we kind of want to like go, ooh, I'll have some of that and some of that and some of that. Because they're, they're shiny and exciting and technology is exciting. But unfortunately, this is the depressing part, we do have to roll back to say, what? What problem am I trying to solve? Is the problem I'm trying to solve CV driven development? Is the problem that there are no microservices on my CV? Or maybe it's not quite that, but maybe my problem is that I don't have enough containers and I can fix that by adding loads and loads of containers. Well, that's, that's not really a, a problem that you should be trying to fix. Maybe, maybe you've decided the problem I'm trying to solve is that I don't have enough microservices. So you go and you pick the microservices off the shelf. But then, when you open the tin, you discover it's actually a can of spaghetti. And when you look more closely at the fine print that no one told you about before you decided to do microservices, you realize that there's a little warning and it says, you thought you were getting microservices, but you may actually still be getting all of this coupling. And the, there's cloud native spaghetti in there. And it might even be a distributed monolith. And, and again, you can't necessarily know just from looking at the architecture diagram which one you have. And just because you have hundreds of Git repos, it doesn't mean you have microservices. It could just mean that you have a monolith spread over hundreds of Git repos. Um, I think it should be obvious that this is bad, but just to emphasize, this is bad. A, a distributed monolith, I think, really is the worst of both worlds, because in a monolith, your IDE is going to help you out a lot. It's going to give you the type safety. It's going to give you the compile time checking so that when you use the wrong method signature, it tells you at compile time rather than at runtime in production at 2 in the morning. And the other thing that you get with a monolith is you get guaranteed function execution. So when you call that method, it's running in the same process. Unless the whole thing crashes, it's going to execute. Whereas 
with microservices. You sort of send your function call out by HTTP or messaging, and you kind of hope that something's on the other end, but it might be, it might not be, and you have to do a lot of work to handle the case where it's not, and, and is that okay, and what does it mean? And that doesn't mean that you shouldn't do microservices. There's a lot of really big advantages to microservices. But what it does mean is microservices, they're not the goal. They're the means to solve some other problem. And the other problem might be that we can't ship these independent units quickly enough. It might be that, you know, whatever it is, that's the thing you need to figure out. And so I used to work for IBM, and I used to work in the IBM garage, and we had so many conversations with businesses there where they would say, right, so I need you to help me get to microservices. And we always had to kind of rewind and say, microservices are not a goal. What problem are you actually trying to solve? And it's, microservices, they're not even the only means to solve that problem. They're a means. Sometimes we can solve that problem in a, in a cheaper way. But I think when we think about cloud-native and microservices, I think we sometimes imagine that if we take our application and we kind of smear it out over the internet a little bit and we have these, these network connections where we didn't have it before, it's the network connections that makes our application cloud-native. But that's just, <laughs> that is not true. What you get from those network connections is pain. So who remembers the distributed computing fallacies? Two hands. That's, that's exactly what I expected, because the problem with the distributed computing fallacies, the reason they're fallacies, is that no one remembers them. That's the whole point of a fallacy, is that you forget it. And you sort of imagine that the network is reliable, and you imagine that latency is zero, and that bandwidth is infinite until you try and use conference Wi-Fi, and then you realize that bandwidth is definitely not infinite. And you met you know, you all of these things that you imagine that the network is secure, and, and that's just not true. Um, and you have to account for that, and you have to account for that really early in your development process. And there's one more fallacy that I would add as well, which is often we say, the problem I'm trying to solve with microservices is that my application is so coupled. If I put network communication in between the different parts of my application, it will become less coupled because it's distributed. Distributed and decoupled are not synonyms. And so this means that there's a lot of reasons not to do microservices. So if you're a small team, it's, it's just not worth the overhead. If you're never planning to release the parts of your application independently, you're losing a huge part of the benefit of microservices. All you have at that point is kind of independent scalability. There's a lot of conversation about service meshes. A lot of people hear service meshes and they kind of go, ooh, that's, that's quite complicated and expensive and heavy. And I definitely don't want a service mesh. But I do need to have a way for my application to talk securely amongst itself. And I do need to have a way to do service discovery. And I knew, do need to have a way to do some of these rollouts. So I'll just write some code that does these things. And you start out with 10 lines of code that does these things. And then two years later, you have just written a service mesh, congratulations. But the worst part is that you, have to you had to write it yourself, and you have to maintain it yourself. So whether you do it yourself or whether you use a service mesh, it's a problem that you're going to have to solve. And another problem, sometimes the domain model just doesn't split nicely. Sometimes that coupling is kind of just there, fundamentally and architecturally. One of the first microservices projects I did, I was sort of called in as a consultant to a, a, a customer, and they were having real, real problems. And so when I landed, I got off the plane, and the first thing they said to me was, every time we change one microservice, another one breaks. On the good days, one other microservice breaks. On the bad days, like six other microservices break. 
And of course, if you've been paying attention, you know that the promise of microservices is that they're decoupled. But remember the, fa the fallacy, just because they both start with D, distributed doesn't mean decoupled. You can be really, really distributed and have completely evil spaghetti under the covers. So how do you know if you're decoupled? I heard a really good rule of thumb from Dave Farley, because you can, of course, do you know, the detailed analysis, but the easiest and quickest thing to do is to look at your version numbers. If you're decoupled, you can deploy independently without fear. If you look at the, the releases, and every single thing has the same version number, you know that either you can't release independently because it, it's, you just can't, or maybe you could, but everyone's too scared to try. And so either way, <laughs> you, you have a problem. You, you, have, you have coupling. And so a, a sort of a, a healthy decoupled system will look more like that where you see that some things are evolving at a much faster pace than others, and the business didn't have a heart attack in order to, to do those releases. But often what we see is actually the exact opposite. So we've worked with some businesses, and they were so scared of independent deployability that they said, we need to make sure that nobody ever thinks of deploying a microservice without bringing all of the other microservices along with it. We're going to have one big pipeline to deploy all of our microservices concurrently to enforce that everything gets deployed at the same time. At this point, you may as well have a monolith. Well, in fact, you do have a monolith. You just have a distributed monolith. But even this situation, where everything is getting released at the same time is better than what we sometimes see. Because if everything is getting released at the same time, at least things are getting released. But what we often see is that even with this new shiny cloud-native cloud -native microservices architecture, things don't get released because the business is too scared of releasing things. And and so again, when, you know, when, we, when we look at the version numbers, there's a good rule of thumb for this, too. <laughs> if everything's on version 1, version 1.1, uh, I think we, we need to work on getting better at releasing. And I, I'm sort of using release and deploy a bit interchangeably. I think a lot of us do that. But actually, those two are really different concepts, and I think that's part of what unlocks deploying often, is realizing that you can deploy things without actually releasing it. Releasing it is when it's exposed to your users, and then they hate it, and then they start writing in. A deploy just means it's somewhere on the cloud in a server that's not your staging server. And if you do things like deferred wiring, you can deploy really, really safely. So that just means you have your thing, you deploy it, but nothing talks to it, so it can't possibly do any harm, even if you've written the world's worst ever code. So here, you know, we've got version 2. Nothing's talking to it. It is totally safe to keep pushing that thing. You may want to be um, a little bit more connected than that. You might want to start trying things out. So you can do things like feature flags to say, I can turn the function on and off, depending if I like it or not. Or you can do things like A-B testing or canary deploys. So, you know, something like launch darkly. That can help a lot. But when I, when I sort of look into why are we not deploying, one of the things that I can sort of see is it comes down to, as well, how we think about CI, CD. So I always worry when a customer tells me, we have a CI CD. Because CI CD, we've now, I think a bit like cloud native, we've kind of even forgotten what, what was this, what, what does it mean? But 
CI-CD is continuous integration and continuous deployment. That's, that's a verb, not a noun. So if you have Jenkins sat in the corner, but you never actually deploy, it's not CI-CD. Um, and so we, again, I think I'm talking about cloud native, but you know, we see a really similar conversation with DevOps, that DevOps used to be a way of doing things. And then at some point, DevOps turned into a job description, and people you know, would sort of start to try and hire DevOps teams that didn't talk to the, to the dev team. And often, the ops team just rebranded themselves as the DevOps team, and it just all was quite sad. Um, if, you, if you have time, I would recommend. I happened to find this the other day. Um, Matt Stratton, he's, um, a, he used to work for Red Hat ages ago. And then he works for Pulumi now. Um, he wrote this absolutely brilliant article about how you can't buy DevOps. And he says, you can't buy DevOps. That's not true. <laughs> Even if you can't buy DevOps, I would love <laughs> to sell you DevOps. A bit like Quarkus, right? <laughs> um, and and there, is this, you know, there is this thing where, because we like buying things and people like selling things, these, these things that should be a way of doing things tend to get productized and, and sold in packages. Um, the other thing about DevOps is you can't buy DevOps. If you only want a little bit of DevOps, you can't buy a DevOps either. You have, to, you have to have more of it. So CI, CD, it is not a noun. It's something you do. It's not a tool you buy. And I think a very small fraction of the world's CI, CD systems are actually doing continuous integration or continuous deployment. Because what I often hear is things like, I'll merge my branch into our CI next week. And again, as a reminder, <laughs> CI is continuous integration once a week, coding away for once a week, and then integrating. That's not continuous. No matter how you define continuous, that's not continuous. That's merge hell. And it's the same thing with releases. So, you know, we sort of get this, I, you know, we talk about CI CD, we talk about CI CD, and then we sort of add, and we release every six months. But that's, that's not CD. And then you sort of get into this situation, you know, the, the sort of the Inigo Montoya situation where you think, you keep saying this word continuous. I don't think that word means what you think it means because every six months just is not continuous. And often, even though we're not releasing very often, we still have this idea that we want to release more often and we think maybe microservices is going to help. So we talked to a bank, it was sort of a you know, a large legacy bank, and their lunch was getting absolutely eaten by the new challenger banks. And they were trying to figure out what, what's going wrong? Why, why are we getting beaten by these challenger banks? And then they looked, and they had this huge COBOL estate, and they said, that would be it. That's the problem. If we change from COBOL to something more modern and cloud native, and if we make microservices, We'll, fit, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be there. You know, and then they said, can you help us migrate to micro microservices? And we were like, oh, yes, yeah. You know, as a consultancy organization, we were like, uh-huh. Um, but then they added, our release board only meets twice a year. So at that point, it doesn't matter how many microservices you have. You know they're only going out the door twice a year. You may as well stick with the COBOL. Well, there's good reasons not to stick with COBOL because COBOL developers are really expensive and they have an annoying tendency to die because they're quite old. But apart from that, <laughs> you could stick with the COBOL. And what, what we also see a lot is that there's just this sort of accumulation of ritual around releases because releases are scary. So, you know, we sort of say, okay, so we've, we've done the thing, it's, it's great, let's release it, right? 
And then it comes back, well, uh, yeah, well, we can't actually release a microservice because it has to go through the release board. And all the other microservices need to be released at the same time, and I'm afraid they're not ready. And of course, the interdependencies are quite complicated, and we have a lot of coupling, so we need to do a manual QA cycle to make sure that everything works together. And then, of course, that's quite a lot to keep track of, so we have a release checklist, which is 82 tabs in an Excel spreadsheet. And then, of course, once we've done all that, we mustn't forget the incantations. And and of course, there's a deadline, right? So there has to be a death march to make sure that we cram a few more features in before we do the release, because it took us six months to do the release. We need to make sure it's as worth it. And then, of course, you know, we need to sacrifice a goat, and the moon has to be in the right phase. And meanwhile, you're sat there with this code that is tested, that works, and you're just going, <laughs> you told me you had CICD. I believed you. Why did I believe you? And the thing about releasing is, if you only release occasionally, that's what it's going to be like. But a dentist once told me, if when you brush your teeth, it bleeds, like if it hurts when you brush your teeth, the solution is not to brush your teeth less. The solution is not to go, ooh, it bleeds when I brush my teeth. I better not do that for another six months. Right? You need to brush your teeth more. You need to do it more and more and more until it st stops hurting. And it's exactly the same with releases. If your releases are really small and really automated, you don't need to sacrifice a goat because you do it so often that it's easy. But of course, the response when, when we sort of have that conversation is, well, like, yeah, I'd, I'd love to ship more often, but oh, have you seen those developers over there? We can't ship more often until we have confidence in the quality. And then the next sentence usually is, have you got automated tests? Oh, no, 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 our, our tests aren't automated. And so when someone says, our tests aren't automated to me, what I hear is, we have no idea if our system works. We intend to find out in a few months whether it works or not. Right? We need to be doing this as often as possible, and we need to make it so that we catch regressions early. Because solving coupling is really hard. It's, you know, it's not as easy as just splitting things across a few GitHub repos. But if you're going to be spaghetti, you should at least be tested spaghetti. And there is a good solution to, to the issue of coupling across the microservices as well which is, as well as your integration tests and your unit tests and all of the rest, you really need contract tests. And contract tests are hard. In order to get contract tests working properly, you need to talk to the people who are consuming your microservice. You need to talk to the people who are producing the services you use. You need to negotiate how you're going to change, what you're going to do with breaking changes. But the thing about contract tests is, if you do contract tests, you have that negotiation about how you handle breaks at build time. Otherwise, you have it at production at 2 in the morning when you just discovered that you didn't have the conversation about how you handle breaking changes. So if contract tests are too hard, microservices are definitely way, way, way too hard, right? It, you know, it's one of those things. But a lot, a lot of organizations, they you know, they kind of know all this, and they, they want to change, but any change to the code base seems to be impossible, and any change to the code base seems to bring in so many dependencies that actually releasing code is impossible. And of course, this is when you know, maybe I should be doing microservices, but it's not that easy. Because when we, I think when we imagine microservices, we sort of think about our layer, the business logic layer, and we say, too coupled, too big, let's split it up. But of course, that layer doesn't exist in a vacuum. There's going to be a database layer. There's going to be a front-end layer. If it's a big organization, there's probably going to be an integration layer, too. And in my experience, people in the integration team hate their lives, and they're sort of a colleague described them as a panicked sandwich, because for most, 
I, I don't know if the people are smiling now because they're in the integration team and they're going, I, 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 it's okay, I'm, I'm fine. The, there's, they sort of tend to get a lot of demands from, from both sides, which is the nature of integration. So I think we've learned now that if you have microservices code and a monolithic database, that's not going to work. It's going to drag you down. It's going to stop you being able to make changes. So now we have, we're pretty good at splitting the database up so that we have a database per microservice. But of course, we need to do the same for the front end. I think we're getting a lot better, too, at splitting up the front end so we have micro front ends. I think some of the technology makes it a little bit harder, but we've kind of got there. But then often, even if we've done all of that, we still have this huge monolithic integration layer. So again, we need to apply those same principles to the integration layer. Otherwise, what we end up with is we're ready to release, and we put in the feature request to the integration team, who are a panicked sandwich who hate their lives because they have too many demands on them. And then they, you know, it takes them too long to do it because they have to batch their changes. So we really need to be thinking about modularization in the integration layer too. And of course, once you've done all that, that is a lot of moving parts. So at that point, you really need a new approach to ops. Although actually you don't need a new approach to ops, the approach to ops you need is DevOps, which we've been doing for like 10 years, except that we haven't actually been doing DevOps for 10 years because we forgot what DevOps meant and we thought we could buy DevOps and you can see where this is going. So the new, new approach to ops, which is quite closely related to DevOps, is SRE. So we need to be bringing some of those engineering skills into the ops side so that we have the automation, so that we're making sure that we can fix problems before they happen, rather than just being really reactive, because otherwise we're never going to be able to handle that huge pile of moving parts. And another thing about SRE that I really like is it's, it's a new approach to risk. So SRE has this great idea of the error budget, which is, honestly, we know we are not going to achieve perfection, but it's about how we balance forward work against trying to, to keep the system stable. And we can adjust. If we become too unstable, we do less forward work. But it does it in a really kind of controlled, conversational way. But with, with SRE, one of the really important ideas is it's not that it's embracing risk and saying, hey, we don't care if things fall down. It's about how do we reduce the risk? The best way we can reduce risk is through automation, not paperwork, right? Like, let's automate all the things, and it becomes better and safer. And again, this can be hard because 20 or 30 years ago, paperwork, possibly, I'm still not convinced, but you know, paperwork was the best way to manage risk. And so a lot of organizations have this institutional memory of how to manage risk, and we need to unlearn these habits, not because we want to be reckless, but because it's actually safer. And with the cloud especially, if you take the sort of the old style governance and apply it to the cloud, what you end up with is something that has the cost profile of the cloud, but the productivity of the old way of doing it, which is bad. Years ago, an IBM colleague told me a story. I don't actually even know if this story is true, but I like it so much I, I tell it anyway. This was kind of before, before proper cloud, and you know, just starting to look at, at virtual machines. And we sold them a piece of software that would allow them to provision a virtual machine in 10 minutes, which now is like whatever. But at the time, it was amazing. They were like, yes, yes, we're going to be able to provision in 10 minutes. But then they came back to us and they said, this, this software that you sold us is broken. It takes us three months to provision a, an instance. And we were thinking, what is it doing? Is it taking like each pick, you know, each byte of the virtual machine and like putting it on like, you know, a, a caterpillar and then sending it to the data center? What, what's going on? 
So we looked into it, and we realized that they had taken this software, and they'd put an 84-step pre-approval process in front of it. So of course no one could get instances in 10 minutes, because they had to fill in 84 pieces of paperwork. And so again, this software that we sold them was completely pointless. They may as well not have bought the software because of how it was being used. I mentioned cloud cost profiles, because of course, that, the one thing with cloud native, the one thing that you can absolutely definitely buy is you can buy cloud. And not only can you buy cloud, you can buy a lot of cloud. You can buy so much cloud that you may not actually want all of the cloud that you bought. In fact, I, I think we can say a stronger statement than that. I think you definitely don't want all of the cloud that you bought. And almost every organization that I've worked with has someone whose job it is to try and figure out why they're spending so much money on the cloud and who forgot to turn off their instance. I saw a, a statistic, and they reckon that last year, just instances that should have been turned off, that weren't turned off, cost $26 billion on public cloud, which is a lot of money. I've seen a, an, another piece of research, and they reckon that a quarter of servers are doing no useful work. They, they were just forgotten, and they're somewhere in the cloud just using cycles, but not actually useful. And I think that the thing is, right, like we have all done this. When I first learned Kubernetes, I did what anybody would do, which is I provisioned a cluster. But unfortunately, I had too much work in progress. So I went away and got sidetracked by another project. And then I came back to my cluster two months later. And I'd done a decently specced cluster. So it was 1,000 pounds a month, this cluster that had just been sat there for two months, burning money. Oops, so that was a slightly awkward conversation with my boss. But the thing is, it happens everywhere. So there was, there was a lovely story the other year from a startup, and they, they were on what they thought was a free tier, and they made a change on Friday, just a little change to one of their little test scripts. And they came back in on Monday morning, and they went, why are we out of business? <laughs> what happened over the weekend? And they'd, they'd burned $72,000 on this script that had an infinite loop in it. And the, the bad thing in that case was um, the cloud provider said, hey, you seem to have an infinite loop, and you're using a lot of cloud that's not going to fit in the free tier. And so it said, let us automatically upgrade you to a more expensive tier so we can accommodate your infinite loop, which obviously is not how it should work. And I think they did eventually get it sorted out. But you know, these things can happen everywhere to, to anyone. Um, how many of you use haveibeenowned.com? Oh, very few hands. Yeah, one, one. It, it's, um, it's quite a useful site. It's um, Troy Hunt. He's a, a security expert. He works for Microsoft. And he's got this site where you can go and you can look to see how often your password appears in the data sets of people's stolen passwords so that you can see, oh, look, my password got stolen. Let me, let me sort that out. So obviously, he knows a thing or two about computers. And over Christmas last year, he had you know, very tiny running costs for this site. It was just a static site. And then all of a sudden, he had a $12,000 bill. And when he looked into it, um, what the root cause was like a tiny little caching misconfiguration where something was supposed to be cached, but there was a setting that said, don't cache this file if it gets really large, which obviously is a really stupid setting, because I can't think of any circumstance where you say, cache it if it's small. But if it's big, oh, no, 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 I want to pay the data transfer fees for that one every day, right? Like, it's a stupid setting, but the setting existed. He had it misconfigured. Well, he had the defaults, which were stupid. And so then he got this huge bill. And 
so for almost every organization, once it gets to a certain scale, the cloud becomes this kind of mystery money pit where we have, we have servers, we don't know which of them are useful, which of them are not. What we sometimes end up doing is we say, we're gonna, we're gonna sort of shut the barn door before the horse is bolted, so we're gonna have an 84-step approval process before you can get your cloud instance to make sure we don't have a money pit. But all that happens then is that people do the 84-step approval process, and then they forget the server after they've done it, so it doesn't, it doesn't really help. I think we are seeing some useful things now. So um, the backstage management plugin that, that Spotify wrote, there's a cost insights plugin that you can get for it. And businesses who've been using it, some of them have been saving millions just in a few months. Because what it does is it takes that cost information and it makes it visible to the engineers along with the rest of the information that you care about, like your monitoring and that kind of thing. Because really, cost is now, in the cloud, it's an engineering concern. And so there's this new discipline of FinOps, which I think is really just trying to figure out who in your organization forgot to turn off their cloud. But I don't want to... I said this was the most depressing talk, and I don't want to end on this really miserable note. Um, so I do want to have just a few things that I've seen for... How to, how to do it right. So the first thing is don't do all of the things that I said were wrong. Um, but I think, I think sometimes when we, when we talk about cloud native and how you can't buy it, and then it sort of becomes this cultural conversation. And you know, I used to talk about how cloud native was culture, not containers. And I think then we sort of say, oh no, I, I'm a techie. I don't, I don't want to talk about culture. I want to talk about containers. That's way more exciting. Um, so there's sort of ways that we can think about what we need to do to be cloud native. And, and some of them are really tangible. We can hold them, we can see the source code. So things like the CNCF products, you know, that's something, it's part of the recipe, totally tangible. And then the slightly fluffier is the architecture. Slightly fluffier still is how do we do our operations? And then at the fluffiest level, is these sort of business drivers of, what problem are we trying to solve? The people who pay me, what, what do they care about? How does, how does my organization make money? And I think when we think about culture, you know, maybe we kind of want to be thinking about culture, but we kind of don't want to be thinking about culture, but those business drivers and the operations, I think, sort of fit into the culture category. So if we're looking at those, we're in a pretty good place. And with that, I'll stop. That QR code is the slides, and I think I've got about three minutes for questions. Thank you very much.